Welcome to the National. Welcome. to the National Newspaper Publicist Association's Let It Be Known. Today, we delve into a critical and pressing issue affecting the safety and well-being of our students and schools nationwide. Recently, six prominent organizations, the Southern Poverty Law Center, the Advancement Project, Alliance for Educational Justice, the National Women's Law Center, the In Our Lives, or In Our Names Network, they are In Our Lives, In Our Names Network, and Interrupting Criminalization, join forces to assess the profound impacts of police presence in schools with a specific focus on black girls, trans and gender expansive youth. This collaborative effort highlighted in a national virtual event moderated by Tor Tarana Burke of the Me Too movement and Andrea J. Ritchie, the author of Invisible No More, police violence against black women and women of color, it brings to light findings from three years of data collection and community conversations. The conclusions are alarming and reveal that the presence of police in and around schools uh, perpetrates violence or perpetuates violence, including sexualization, harassment, and assault of students. Today, Ashley Sawyer, the senior staff attorney at the Advancement Project and Tamika Staley with In Our Names Network joins us on Let It Be Known. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Ashley, it seems like uh, I guess uh, Tamika will be joining us momentarily. But uh, Ashley, I just want to jump right in on this. Um, it's a lot to unpack. But how should schools and policymakers immediately address the disproportionate impact of police assaults on Black students? Well, it's actually quite simple as far as we're concerned. We need to remove police from schools. Police presence in schools only exacerbates the school to prison pipeline, and it makes it so that students are in fear every single day of whether or not a simple mistake, or even if they haven't done anything wrong, might end them up in the juvenile legal system or the criminal legal system, or worse, they might end up dead or seriously injured. And so if we want to make schools places that are for learning, exploration, creativity, then we have to remove the elements of jails and prisons that we bring into schools when we have police presence. Put, put your legs down. Put your legs down now. The 26-page federal civil lawsuit filed on November 27th reveals the aftermath and the extent of J.D.'s injuries after the alleged assault. J.D.'s parents filed the lawsuit on his behalf. The suit claims Deputy Jayco violated J.D.'s Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights, calling his actions a vicious physical assault on a disabled eight-year-old boy. Um, and actually, it just brings to mind this. Um, do we have a handle on, because I remember like going to school, it, was, it, was, it wasn't until um uh, my senior year in school did i remember some sort of uh police or security presence or you know an obvious security presence in school when did the phenomenon of placing uh police officers in school begin do you do you happen to know yes i'm so glad you point that out because it's always important to remember that this wasn't always the case <clears throat> that schools were not always set up to look like prisons um, we really see the uptick in police presence in schools in the, around the civil rights movement. Advancement Project published a report called We Came to Learn, which clearly articulates the timeline of school hardening, as we call it. And it really is linked to more Black students and Brown students beginning to protest along the civil rights movement. And then we see an additional uptick in the zero tolerance era, the late 90s, early 2000s, when you hear people using phrases like super predator to refer to black and brown young people and then again we see that increase around that time um, of the war on drugs and the so-called zero tolerance policies which we now have the benefit of hindsight and tons of data indicating that those school hardening measures actually have been very ineffective and have not made schools safer 
Now, see, Ashley, I'm going to take offense to something you when I mentioned that when I was in my senior year in high school, I started noticing this in you like, yeah, back in the civil rights movement. It was I was not in high school back in the civil rights movement. <laughs> <laughs> My apologies, but you know, I think you point out something very important, which is that this has not always been the case. No, there was absolutely. a time when schools were nurturing environments and could and could we can continue to create nurturing environments for black students and brown students um, outside of the school hardening measures that we see in place right now. Yeah, absolutely. I am certainly uh, glad you pointed that out. Uh, and. So now we, we want to bring in uh, Tamika Staley with In Our Names Network. Tamika, thank you also for joining uh, Ashley uh, and myself on this very, very uh, important uh, conversation. Yes, thank y'all. Good. Uh, Devon Rising, good afternoon, uh, wherever you may be. I'm definitely uh, happy to be here and representing In Our Names Network as well as Every Black Girl Inc. Well, uh, Tamika, I'm going to go to you with this question. What interventions, Tamika, do you recommend to address and prevent the increase in sexual assaults within school environments? We talked about, Ashley and I talked about the uh, police presence, which many of us do not welcome in, in our schools. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the interventions you recommend to address these problems? Well, the first thing that I recommend is doing a lot of work around consent. And um, the first thing that came to mind was consent training, but I've been changing my language around the term consent training um, only because to me, it, it sometimes sounds very carceral. So, and, and, and I want to stay away from that type of language because language definitely does mean things and it infiltrates and conditions us in certain ways to predict our behavior. So I mm -hmm. want to say uh, doing some internal, some healing work around consent and really teaching people what it means to give consent and to accept consent and to honor people's boundaries around consent. Uh, that's the number one thing that I see. I'm a sex educator and I run an organization uh, teaching Black and queer young folks about consent and how to instill that in their everyday lives and how to recognize when that consent is being violated. And they always tell me like they don't they want that in school. They want um, more talks and conversations and discussions about consent, what that means. And the adults are the ones that, that need it the most. Uh, and I think that that's going to be very pivotal in us working towards this more liberatory and this more creative and imaginative future where police sexual violence or sexual violence in general does not exist. So that's one thing. And another thing that I would recommend and suggest as an intervention is really looking at the ways that we instill this idea of discipline, right? So that is disrupting our ways and recreating some norms around what it looks like to teach young people about their mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the work that In Our Names Network does talks about how the state really penalizes black women and gender expansive folks for, you know, things that are that are definitely just mistakes, like being being human, right? And those things, those those types of disciplines are very harsh and very violent. So some interventions that really disrupt that and really recreate, you know, that there's a way to have a conversation with someone when they make a mistake, when they are doing something that is considered wrong or harmful and that those ways do not have to be violent. Those ways shouldn't be violent. And also thinking about like what is considered to be a mistake or wrong or quote unquote a crime and what is really just being human, like being a person. So yeah. I think that there definitely needs to be some, uh, some, some implementations around healing justice, right. You know, to, to really offset that type of those disciplinary actions that we see going on in and outside of schools. And so we see uh, the Advancement uh, Project, the In Our Names Network, Southern po Poverty Law Firm, and, and others. Uh, you, you guys have done tremendous work on this. But uh, actually, what interventions? Um, let's talk about um, the interventions, but not, not just the interventions, but what factors, I should say. She talked about the interventions, but what factors contribute to the Southern states disparity in assaults and how can these communities work towards safer school environments? Thank you for that question. So it's unfortunate that Southern states are so overrepresented in the most recent data that Advancement Project has put out. And there's a couple of hypotheses. One of them being is that many Black students are in the South and we see 
that wherever there is a school that is predominantly students of color, that's where we see an increase in criminalization and increase in policing. And the other factor is that many Southern schools and school districts require police presence. We think about places like Florida. And so where there's very little flexibility and it's harder for organizers to create the kinds of demands that they want for school environments that are safe and healing for young people, we find that in school districts where there is a state mandate requiring police, even though, again, it's important to note that police presence does not prevent school shootings and there's now data backing that. Mm -hmm. And so, but there is this mandate that we see really heavily in the South. And certainly there are attitudes and beliefs that date back for centuries about Black children and Black bodies needing to be controlled and needing to be surveilled, right? And we see those attitudes and those beliefs permeating all of U.S. culture. So I don't want to place too much emphasis on the South because these incidents happen all over the United States. But there is a need for greater investment and organizing in parents and students, particularly parents and students of color, organizing in the Deep South, in Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, South Carolina, and so forth. And so there's work to be done, but I want to make sure that we're emphasizing that all of us in this country have to be accountable for how we treat Black and Brown and Latinx students. Now, Ashley and I talked a little bit, uh, Tamika, about um, police and schools uh, as you, you, you came in on that part of the conversation. But talk about, if you will, um, the assault at report that shows a significant increase in sexual assault by police uh, in schools. And, and how was the, um, the t- talk about the launch of that report, if you, if you could. Yes, absolutely. So since 2015, Advancement Project and the Alliance for Education Justice has been tracking incidents of students being assaulted by cops in or or around schools since the very famous viral moment. We call it hashtag assault at Spring Valley, where a young black girl was slammed from her desk in South Carolina. Um, That incident made headlines. And then we started to track and work alongside local organizers to make sure that we're keeping a pulse on these assaults and also thinking about how do we organize to create the types of schools that we want. In 2023, this year, we updated the report where my colleagues have been analyzing these incidents. And unfortunately, there were over 372 incidents of school police assaults since we began, since 2011, where a lot of our tracking begins. And so you can imagine that's every single year students are being body slammed, tased, beaten up, knocked unconscious, and in some cases, sexually assaulted by the police who are in or around their schools. And so we wanted to make sure that we were bringing attention to this and note that of the students who are experiencing this assault, the overwhelming majority of those students are Black students. And so this is certainly a racial justice issue, it's an education equity issue, it's a gender justice issue. And we want to make sure that these stories don't go unnoticed particularly because a lot of times people just don't recognize that young people can be um, victims or survivors of police brutality, just like adults in the community. And we want to make sure that young people are lifted up, particularly because just like, you know, with young people, they have to go and encounter police every single day when they enter the school building, which is a really unique setting for harm when you have to come across police every single day in a way that's almost unavoidable. Wow. Um, Tamika, how can reporting mechanisms be reshaped to ensure that survivors feel uh, supported and confident in the and seeking justice? They can be reshaped by simply believing the survivors. Like when reports are come out, a lot of the times the language on these um, sexual assault incidents is very victim blaming. You know, it's always focusing on the clothing of the person who experienced the assault, what they were doing, what they said, you know, being on their phone, like Shakar was apparently on her phone in the classroom at Spring Valley. And and that was the cause for calling the officer in, you know, Mm -hmm. things like that. So instead of focusing on the action of the person who experienced the assault, I think it should just be more, it definitely should just be more focused and centering on justice and and prevention and so i think that 
just going straight there as far as a reporting aspect that's gonna that's gonna build more confidence in survivors coming forward because they know that they'll actually be believed that people's gonna actually take their concerns and them speaking up for themselves and saying like this happened to me that's gonna that's gonna build the confidence there it's just being believed and and, and seeing language that is empowering and censoring the student and their wellness versus you know what they did to cause this thing you know right you know because at the end of the day nothing causes assault but the person who does the assault like the perpetrator is the cause of the assault nothing else everything else is 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 a mere just irrequitable fact like mm -hmm. oh i was on my phone i was wearing a miniskirt okay that doesn't cause mm -hmm. assault you know people cause assaults to happen so that that's definitely going to build some confidence around more young people coming forward when these things happen to them yeah i think that's a a great great point because we do uh, oftentimes, even even with uh, police violence in the streets, we you know George Floyd, for instance, you know what was he doing to cause mm -hmm. this, or yeah. what was this? Yeah. You know that's a that's a great point. Um, Ashley, um, speaking of the report, were there variations? Because we talked about the South, right? But were there uh, variations and experiences reported by young people in different regions? And and along that lines, how can local communities tailor solutions to ex to address specific needs? <clears throat> you know, I actually would have to refer to my colleagues for to talk to do more analysis around those regional variations. But we at Advancement Project, alongside Alliance for Education Justice, have a network of organizers in local communities across the country who are working on education equity issues and working towards police free schools. And that work network is called the National Campaign for Police Free Schools, policefreeschools.org. And so what we've been doing is not necessarily like a top down um, effort to end school hardening, but really working with local organizers and thinking about what's going on in their specific community, what their specific community demands are. And that includes organizers in Nashville, Tennessee, Madison, Wisconsin, the Black Organizing Project in Oakland. Um, we could go on and on. Organizers who in each community, I'm thinking about Brighton Park Neighborhood Council in Chicago, all of these organizers have collaborated together to share ideas and to think critically about what is it that would make our schools safer? What are the investments that we want to see happen? Often we'll see where efforts are made to remove some police, the efforts are not made to make the investments that actually help young people who are experiencing mental health crises. There are not a lot of investments made in things like comprehensive sexual health education, which Tamika referred to, right? Students are saying they want to know about their health, they want to know about their well-being, but there's always a conversation of, oh, there's no resources for that. But somehow, some way, school districts have resources to invest in police and prisons. And so we have been um, really working with the local organizers for them to help think about what are their demands, what do they want to see happening in Raleigh, North Carolina, as in comparison to New York City. At the core of the work is to make schools liberatory at the core and the shared value across all of our efforts are to remove police from schools and to really give young people space to learn and to grow in safety. Yeah, and actually you kind of uh, uh, went into another question I had and um, Tamika, you can jump in on this. Um, we, we think about the victims, uh, but what about victims who have disabilities or mental health challenges? Um, what, um, how can we better support those students uh, in efforts to reform school uh, policing? Yeah, that's such a great question because it doesn't come up often enough for sure. So in my experience, providing accessible buildings, like just something at the baseline of that, providing accessible classrooms providing accessible chairs and seats and and viewing a material that that's a a great start to mm -hmm. to help in uh, students because it, it creates an environment of care right because what i've what i've noticed over many years being a survivor myself and also working with survivors working with a lot of black queer youth that are survivors um who also have disabilities and other co-occurring conditions like all at once co-occurring identities the environment of mistreatment is what breeds sexual violence right the mm -hmm. environment of like neglect and this idea of like what bodies deserve deserve care and wellness and which ones do not 
So creating an environment of care where we eliminate barriers for people to have to work hard to be able to do things, you know, that that's a, a great base baseline to mm -hmm. support students with disabilities, um, especially when it comes to preventing certain uh, issues with sexual assault and and just even even with students amongst themselves, you know, interpersonal violence with with each other. I think that that just teaches them, you know, like if I'm seeing one of my classmates who has a disability, whether it's physical, psychological, mental, and I'm seeing the school provide resources for that, you know, I'm seeing ramps, I'm seeing, you know, different plans uniquely curated for students' needs, then that other students are going to more likely to model that. They're going to be able right. to talk to people in a certain way. They're going to be able to, you know, maybe you hold a door for somebody. You see they might need help or or not. If they're telling you that, like, I'm good, respecting the boundary. So just creating a, a, a environment of care where we're conditioned to be accommodating to people who are different than us and mm -hmm. also still treating them like family. You know what I'm saying? Like, this person is still very capable. They're still very autonomous. So yeah, that that environment of care and providing students with just resources that are accessible, that's for me the baseline of, yeah. of supporting students with disabilities in that way. And Ashley, I know that nothing short of getting uh, officers out of schools is going to be sufficient enough. But in the meantime, uh, what steps uh, should be taken to ensure that policing does not escalate to physical uh, harm, physical activity, but prioritizing de-escalation tactics. You know, you said it, you hit the nail on the head. There isn't anything short of this. We have tried over the last 20 some odd years, as you've seen the movement to end school, school policing and the movement um, to stop the school prison pipeline. There have been a lot of interventions, a lot of trainings for school cops, a lot of reports about things that police could or could not do, a lot of efforts to highlight the racial disparities, the disparities for students with disabilities, and it has not worked. Overwhelmingly, we have found that you just can't put, you know, uh, you know, dress up something that is just foul in and of itself. The, you can put as much air freshener on it as you want. You have to remove what is foul and what has what is rotten. And at the end of the day, our young people deserve that. Some of the interventions that Tamika was talking about specifically targeting students um, or supporting students with disabilities. You know, as an attorney, I've done special education work specifically for young people who are at the intersections of the school to prison pipeline. And overwhelmingly, students who get suspended, expelled, or pushed into juvenile prison have some type of special education diagnosis, whether it is for any myriad of behavioral challenges, ADHD, et cetera, et cetera. But what we find is that schools don't often have the resources or the knowledge to meet those students' needs. And we have to ask ourselves, why don't schools have the resources for the appropriate kinds of classroom sizes where their teachers have more than enough help, more than enough tools and resources? And often the answer to that question is because we have spent most of our money to punish students and to hire people to catch students if they make a mistake or even if they have not, rather than saying, what if we took the millions and millions of dollars that school districts across the country spend on policing and put those millions of dollars towards training students and training teachers about consent and healthy boundaries? What if we put those millions of dollars for creating wellness and meditation spaces? Some of the young black girls in Mississippi have talked about creating meditation spaces in their schools in the Mississippi Delta as an alternative or really as a, a, a way to remove school-based corporal punishment. So young people are coming up with solutions and strategies, but often they're met with lots of no's and lots of budget cuts because we're told, oh, there's no money for these things. But when in reality, if we make the right investments and we say these children are valuable, black, brown, indigenous children are valuable and sacred mm -hmm. to us, and we will spend whatever it takes to give them the kind of learning environments that they deserve, then we will find on the out on the back end that we see less violence and conflict in school when students are really feeling supported and cared for. And honestly, until we stop investing in policing and criminalization of schools, we're going to continue to see these horrific assaults, horrific sexual assaults. There really isn't a reform that's going to stop that from happening unless we really make the commitment to saying our young people are sacred, their bodies are sacred, and we will not tolerate anything less than safety and love and care for young people. And that's it. Yeah. 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 
and, and Tamika, um, <laughs> she said, period. <laughs> Tamika, um, you know, you, you mentioned the queer and trans um, and, and, you know, essentially the LGBTQ uh, plus uh, community. Um, and I, I hear uh, at, uh, Ashley with care and support, but you do find in some cases, at least, um, we're in the home that support and care isn't there and you get you, they go to school these individuals go to school and then they find that as ashley's been talking about police in their face uh, uh committing some of these uh um just heinous crimes attacks how do they cope how do they begin to cope because you know, I, I watched like Marlon Wayans come out recently to um, talk about his child who is now, you know, is a, is a transgendered uh, individual. Um, we, we know about Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union's uh, child. Uh, we see those examples, but at what point will it become? They don't have to, the parents and others, the loved ones don't have to come out and say, you know, I support them. Because they're saying that, right? Because of the fact that it's uh, it's not the norm right now. So how do we change that? The change really just is internal, and it it really is like a a choice, to be honest. For for people just to say like, I'm ready to do something different. I'm ready to unlearn, relearn, and recreate some of the norms that I've been taught. It's like always the model that I used. So that's the thing because bigotry is is taught, right? You know, we don't just roll out of bed and say that trans people don't deserve equal rights, you know, roll out of bed and say, you know, dark skinned people are less valuable or less beautiful, you know, or you know, that that those things are taught, right? So it really is gonna take individuals on an individual level to just decide to be different, decide to unlearn and decolonize our mindsets around sex and sexuality, you know, that, and, and then change, and then the behavior changes, right? So the behavior is attached to the ideologies and the ide ideologies are learned, right? These are not innate things that we are born with. So that's going to be the change to change the mindset. And then the behaviors will start to change. Then we will start to see legislators make policies and laws that support queer and trans folks. Like we will start to see corporations get rid of their policies, their at will policies. You know, there are several states across the country, South Carolina, where I'm from, is one of them that can fire someone because they're gay or trans. Like they they can. It's just it's legal to do, right? And a lot mm -hmm. of states are at will just for any reason, right? And so they those are certain legal things that protect people to be discriminatory and, 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 be, and, be, and be and engage in bigotry, right? So yeah, that's that's the change. It's really just mm -hmm. an internal choice. And then that starts to catch on and people start to change their behaviors, you know, from the way that you treat somebody on the streets to the way that you create policies, to the yeah. way that you have organizations that provide certain resources, uh, the way that you have conversations about people. So that's that's the change and then we won't need to say like i support this person you know or i you know it, it won't be such a and and i don't get me wrong i i think that that's beautiful that Dwayne wade and you know these these mm -hmm. celebrity parents are supportive right i just think that i can only imagine that i'm sure it can be exhausting to 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 do that you know because mm -hmm. if we just lived in a world where you can just say oh i love my child like just on just a regular like I love and, my and child. that's the point right be, yeah so i yeah i i, I think that that is going to create that normalcy you know because mm -hmm. it is normal it is just very much is it's just going to take other people also doing what a Dwayne way does right you know and 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 shout out to zai way first and foremost i'm going to send to her for just being such a a, a, a a miraculous young person and and not because she's in the limelight and decided you know that this is what she's gonna do because they're you know but just for just existing like literally simply for just existing you know but yeah it's gonna take people to just decide that they're gonna do better that's that's really it so ashley's like you go girl <laughs> <laughs> but ashley um prioritizing student safety um to prevent uh you know extreme harm or even loss of life um due to encounters with law enforcement um 
how do we uh, just underscore again how do we prioritize student safety when it comes to encounters with law enforcement in school settings <clears throat> that's an important question i think first we have to start to talk to young people and get involved in some of the organizing that is happening to remove the police that's happening police and schools. As I mentioned, you know, we're connected to a network of organizers, local organizers across the country, policefreeschools.org. You can find out more about them. Um, and so how do we keep young people safe? I think it's important, Tamika already said, to believe young people when they say, particularly when we're talking about school-based sexual assault, it's, you know, horrific, but a lot of those incidents started with inappropriate text messages between the school cop or the school security guard and the student. If the student is saying, you know, this person said something to me that didn't seem quite right. Or, you know, another student I've met said, you know, this, the cop just said something like, oh, you know, that bodysuit looks real good on you. Those kinds of comments are actually a part of a culture of sexual harassment, and it is completely inappropriate. And so sort of to protect students at the beginning is to believe them, even for the small things, even for the things that don't all automatically rise to the level of assault, the things like the smart, inappropriate comments, mm -hmm. comments about bodies, how the student looks in a particular clothing. We even think about the way we have to maybe reevaluate school dress code. Mm -hmm. If you have a school dress code that says, girls don't have your arms out or girls don't have a low cut blouse, then that what that means is when that student goes to the metal detector every morning to get through school, there might be a school cop there who has the opportunity to critique what that young person is wearing and what's on their body and that opens the door for those inappropriate conversations, those conversations that make young people feel unsafe. And so we have to really be very careful about dismissing sort of what we think of maybe as the smaller things, because they actually might be a part of an indicative of a larger systemic problem, certainly, but in specific incidents could be indicative of a pattern of behavior. And what you'll find in the Assault Act report is that many of the school cops, like many other incidents, who have been engaging in school-based sexual harassment or assault, there's usually more than one ch child and there's usually more than one incident because it's a pattern of using their power to make young people feel like they cannot speak up, make me, young people feel like maybe it's their fault. And in reality, there is a disparate power dynamic and there's also a recognition that our culture tells young people that you have to do whatever cops tell you to do, even at your own risk even if it puts you at risk for sexual violence or harm. And so really believing young people, making space to teach them, as Tamika mentioned about consent. It is not okay for someone to touch you or make comments about your body that you did not consent to. All of those are smaller pieces of a bigger puzzle, but we really do as black parents, organizers, aunts, uncles, um, all of us have to be saying, what are the ways that I can get connected to organizers who are trying to build the kind of safe schools that my young people deserve and that young people themselves deserve. And I think that should be ultimately all of our work to walk alongside young people and support them as they articulate their vision for what makes them feel more safe. Yeah, and uh, finally, how can folks view this report? How, where, where do we go? I would say start you know, reading the stories of the young people, start with you know, making sure that we're centering the young people and in when we follow the hashtag assault, I remember that each of those hashtags, whether it's Spring Valley or, or a different city, that's a real child, a real person who was impacted by that and start right there thinking about them as humans. And then um, I want us to also start to think about um, where, where do we plug into organizing? Organizing is so crucial and key. And then of course, when local you know budget fights happen in your community, you wanna be saying, well, where is our money going? Why is so much money mm -hmm. going for school policing? How come we don't have a licensed therapist or a restorative justice practitioner or just some grandmothers at the front door to greet young people and say, good morning. Why don't we, why can't we pay for that? Oh, we can't pay for that because we've spent the money elsewhere. And so really starting to ask ourselves those questions and listen to young people. Young people know what they need and know what they yes. want. And as we guide them with love and care, they will begin to see what they want for their schools. Many young people have never experienced education without metal detectors and carceral technology. Many young people see school as similar to jail or prison. So we need to help them by giving them resources and exposing them to other ways of being. And as we begin to do that, 
Um, I'm excited to see how we as Black caregivers and family and community who might be watching your show might say, all right, I want to get close to some young people who are organizing. I want to get behind them and support them and, and work alongside them. Yeah. And, and um, Tamika, again, we think about that uh, story that was first brought to us by the uh, Kansas City Defender with a Black girl. Um, it, it was it was confronted by uh, two white girls in the hallway for calling her their slave. Um, and then when the two girls walked away from her, a white boy uh, broke her nose. Um, basically, he, he called her the N-word. So, you know, in addition to the to, to the other to the many, the myriad uh, other issues, um, you still have that going on in some schools. And so, how, how does how does these kids, how do these kids come through this? Oh, I think uh, Tamika uh, froze up. I'm so sorry, uh, Ashley. I'll throw that question to you if you don't mind. <clears throat> yes, that incident is unfortunate and just really horrific, and it's really indicative of the climate, the political climate that we're in, right? We're in a climate where anti-Blackness has always been here, but it's really on the rise. And as we're seeing more legislation, more efforts to prevent students from learning about accurate racial justice history, prevent students from reading books about their own culture, their own experiences, and also it impacts white students. It creates the conditions where they feel comfortable to say horrific racist epithets. And it also, we have to put the accountability on the educators and the school principals. What kind of environment are we creating? Because we only have, we have to really criticize and be open to, to self-reflection about what kind of school environment allows that type of behavior? What are students being taught? What are the ways that racist ideology, anti-Black ideology is being reinforced? And what I would also point out about incidents like the Kansas City one and many others, it's often when Black girls speak up for themselves or defend themselves, they're the ones who get suspended or expelled. Yes, which she was. Even... <laughs> exactly. And that's what stands out to me about the Kansas City incident is that she was the one who was punished, I believe, for five days. Yes. Instead of the students who triggered and started off the whole harmful incident to begin with. And that's a part of an underlying culture of a belief that Black girls always have an attitude Black girls and Black women are always starting the problem. And really, I, I really we have to call into account the administrators and the people in positions of authority for saying, what are you teaching young people and what are you not teaching young people? What kind of school environment are you creating and how are you teaching young people about accurate racial justice history? How are you teaching young people about the harmfulness of certain terms and so that they can understand those things? And it really is about creating liberatory education. And when we see students of color, black students always getting in trouble for things where they were actually the ones who were harmed, we have to start to ask ourselves, how do we hold school districts accountable? Who's holding principals and superintendents and educators sometimes, holding them accountable for how they interact with and create cultures in and around schools serving students of color? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Tamika, uh, how do folks uh, uh, follow in our names network? How do they learn more about uh, you guys? Yes, yeah, so you can learn more by going. Oh, we, we, we oh, there you go. You kind of froze. Um, yeah, some network things are going on, but we pushing through. It's okay. <laughs> the connection can't stop the connection. You feel me? There you go. Uh, in our names network.org and you also can follow us on TikTok, on Instagram, in our names. Uh, Amber, shout out to, to Amber. She is our rapid response coordinator. So she does all of our TikToks about all the cases that we see almost weekly of uh, black women, black uh, trans and cis women, and black exp uh, black gender expansive folks who are experiencing um, assault, the state section violence. So that is a way that you can stay informed about what's going on and how to support the work. Um, our The report is going to be coming out very soon. So that'll be public. The the report that we, In Our Names Network, along with our other network members have done. So you all can view even more data about what we're talking about, uh, see what our process was with our interviews, interviewing young people. And yeah, that's the way you can stay up to date and 
I just am glad that we are here talking about this because the more conversation and dialogue that we have about it, the more that people know, the more that they're going to be ignited and want to create some really tangible changes for more, more like I said, more creative, more imaginative, more liberatory future for, for our young people Absolutely. to live in. Because they deserve it. They deserve it. And we deserve it. Absolutely. Temika Staley with In Our Names Network and Ashley Sawyer, the senior staff attorney at the Advancement Project. We thank you so much for joining the Black Press of America's Let It Be Known. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Mm -hmm.